Well, good evening. Good to see everyone tonight. Let's grab our Bibles. We don't have many more times to say this, but we're turning again to Genesis 49, getting very close to the end of this first book of the Bible. Genesis 49. And I know we just prayed, but if we could, let's just pray once more and just ask the Lord to be our teacher. Father, we know that the world would look at us tonight and think we're crazy, that we're giving up time to come and open up this book that they would say is some archaic book that maybe has some history, maybe doesn't, Lord, but we know, we've tasted your word. We know that we don't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from your mouth. We know that the truths in this book are what change our lives. And so let your word tonight be just that, living and active and do in us, Lord, what needs to be done so we leave here different. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we left Jacob um, kind of at a difficult place last week. We left him on his deathbed. We are reading here of the final moments of his life. You know, a lot of people don't get the opportunity to know they're dying. They don't, they don't get that privilege. But Jacob did, and more importantly, we saw he took advantage of it. We saw in chapter 48, Jacob using his final moments to bless the sons of Joseph, bring these two boys into the inheritance. He, he adopts them as his own sons. And thus Joseph, through them, ends up getting the double portion of the inheritance that typically went to the firstborn. And as chapter 48 ended, we read of, of Jacob making clear to Joseph that even though he was dying, even though he was passing off the scene as the, as the patriarch, as the leader of the family, that God wasn't going anywhere. The Lord was going to, to continue to be with Joseph. He would continue to fulfill the promises that had been made to his family. And now it's to the rest of the family that Jacob now turns here in chapter 49. As we're going to see that the Lord had a future for each of the sons of Jacob. Now, they weren't all going to be blessed as Joseph's line would be, but God had a place for each of them in his plan, eternal plan. It would be each of their families that God would use ultimately to bless and redeem the whole world. And so as we saw last time, even though Jacob was 147 years old at this point, even though his eyes were going bad, even though he was bedridden, even though it was all he could do to, to basically just be propped up in his bed, even though he was physically weak, we saw and learned about Jacob that he was spiritually perceptive. Amazing perception. We saw this in terms of his understanding that the Lord wanted him to give Ephraim even though he was the younger son of Joseph, the greater blessing than Manasseh, who was the oldest. And we see even more of this spiritual perception now as Jacob turns to, to the rest of his sons because what Jacob speaks over them is not only a blessing, but ultimately it's prophetic. Jacob is, even at this old age, even though his body is, is falling apart, again, spiritually he is in tune as he is now given prophetic insight into the future of his sons and the tribes that are going to come from these sons. Jacob's not just giving his wishes here. He's not just giving his thoughts for his boys. These aren't just the musings of some old man who's coming, you know, in and out of, of lucid moments. He's given them a word directly from the Lord. And even though these are specific words for these tribes, what we're going to find as we go through this is there are some important applications I think we can make even for our own lives today. So let's jump in. Verse 1, And Jacob called his sons, and said, Gather together, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather together and hear you, sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. Now we see clearly Jacob understood these were prophetic words. He recognizes that God has given him insight into the future, into what's going to come. This is not just, you know, more dad stories of when I was a kid. He knows this is from the Lord, and that's why he, he is so adamant about drawing their attention to listen to what he's about to say. This is why they should give it utmost priority. Why he says, gather together, hear me, listen to me. Now, it's interesting in, in verse 2 that he uses both of his names in referring to himself. You notice that? He says, gather together, you sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. May have been a recognition that his kids were a combination of both Jacob the one ruled by the flesh, and Israel, the one governed by God. And they would have to continually fight to, to live in that right place, to live according to Israel. Now, sadly, we know throughout much of 
their history, they would live as sons of Jacob. But in the end, in the last days, in the millennium, more specifically, we know they will fully live as sons of Israel. So he begins with Reuben, the firstborn. Reuben, you're my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Now, I imagine Reuben hearing this and thinking, I'm glad I showed up. I'm glad I wasn't late to this meeting. Dad, keep going. I like what you're saying. You're, other guys, you're listening, right? You listen to what he's saying about me. All right, excellency of strength. Um, you know, this power, this, this might. Good stuff. What Jacob is referring to here is the fact that as the firstborn, Reuben had the claim to the inheritance. He had the claim to the leadership of the family to lead the family, to go before them, to direct their course. But, sadly for Reuben, Jacob didn't stop with verse 3. This is what Reuben had as his future. This was his potential based upon his position at birth. But sadly, he forfeited it all. This is what Jacob now lays out, verse 4. He goes on to say, "'Unstable as water, you shall not excel, "'because you went up to your father's bed.'" Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Jacob takes us back in time to Genesis 35. Now, we don't know if the other brothers know this, the fullness of this story or not. But they do at this point. But we remember Genesis 35 when after the death of, of Rachel, Jacob is in mourning, lost the love of his wife. Reuben, his oldest, ends up having relations with Rachel's maid Bilhah, which she was also one of Jacob's wives. As a result of that action, as a result of that defilement, as Jacob refers to it here, the Lord declares now through Jacob that Reuben forfeited his position. It cost him and his descendants from being able to, to walk in the fullness of all that was his as the firstborn son. And it's a reminder that, that sin does that in our lives. Now, Reuben would still be blessed. He would still be a son of Israel. He wasn't kicked out of the family, but there were consequences he had to bear just as we often have consequences in our own lives that sometimes can go on for a long time. I was speaking to someone called to the church early this week, not a part of this church. I'm not sure how they got our number. It, it happens. People just call in, I guess, looking for, for a church, having questions, and, and, and this guy was dealing with some consequences from, his, from, from some sinful actions in his past, and he was feeling like that God was punishing him, judging him, cursing him. I was trying to explain now, when we repent, when we, we turn back to the Lord, which he had done, he forgives us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness, the scripture says. The cross takes away any curse. But there can still be some consequences at times we have to walk through. The Lord doesn't always take those completely away. Now, this action by, by Reuben, it really seems to flow out of, of a character issue with him. You notice Jacob described in the beginning of verse 4 as unstable as water. Unstable refers to being reckless, is the idea, not contained. And it's the idea that, that water will make its own path. If you've ever, you know, watched National, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, you've seen these great floods, or you've been a part of a flood. I mean, just what a hard rain can do. Right? Water will wash out whatever's in front of it. It doesn't matter what's in its way. Water doesn't come to a house. It's just full of and say, oh, I think I better go, I ought to go around this. Right? Water goes right through it. And it's amazing the destruction water can, can cause in its full force. That, that's how Reuben is described here. He's, he's someone who, who can't keep his desires in check. He lets them lead him wherever they want to go. You could say he had uncontrolled passions, which is the very opposite of what's needed for someone in leadership, which was the role Reuben was supposed to hold. Right? The Lord has called us to keep our passions in check. We aren't to be ruled by the flesh, as Scripture says. We are to rule over our flesh. You remember one of the qualities that Paul lists in, in elders, those who are called to lead the church, he mentions this in both Timothy and in Titus, is he says that they are to be temperate. It's not a word we use a whole lot today. It speaks of the ability to control oneself. It literally means strength. It's the idea to have strength over our desires. A leader is not someone who doesn't have desires. A leader is not someone who doesn't have passions. It's not someone who isn't hit with, with temptation. 
but it's someone who understands those desires, those passions have to be brought into subjection to a greater passion. That's what Paul was speaking of when he wrote to the Corinthians, when he said that everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. That's why I said concerning his own life, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should have become disqualified. You know, sometimes we look at the Apostle Paul and think, well, this guy, he, he never had temptation. This guy was above temptation. He never had a stray thought. He never had desires that hit him. No, no, that's not at all what he's saying. He says, I, the Apostle Paul, I have to discipline my body. I have to get harsh with myself and put strong measures in my life to keep the flesh pushed down so that I don't give in and then become disqualified and not allow God to do through me what he desires to do. Paul makes it clear. Our, our passions naturally rise up to rule over us, but we have to take great effort, discipline, to bring them into submission. But because Reuben was a man who wasn't willing to do that, but instead let his desires just take him, like rushing water, wherever they wanted, it cost him. To use Paul's language, he was disqualified, not from being a tribe of Israel, but from enjoying and walking in the blessing of all the privileges that were his as the firstborn. And it was true, just as, again, Jacob prophesied, the tribe of Reuben would never excel. They would end up actually joining with Korah in his rebellion against Moses. They would take their possession outside of the land, on the eastern side of the Jordan. And really, his life is a warning to us about the danger of uncontrolled passions and lust. We can have all the potential, we can have all the privilege in the world, but if we can't bring our flesh under subjection, all those things will do us no good. He continues now, the next two in line. Verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man. In their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. In their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. And so Jacob lumps his next two kids together, that they share a bond. Now, sadly, it's, it's not a good bond. Whereas Reuben was controlled by lust, these two were controlled by anger. Jacob is referring now back to what we read in Genesis 34, when Simeon and Levi's sister, Dinah, was mistreated by the son of the, of the king of Shechem, whose name was also Shechem. And instead of just dealing with this one man and what they did to their sister, Simeon and Levi decide, you know what? The whole town needs to pay. And so they end up murdering, killing every male, right? having them all circumcised. Oh, we'll share our family with you. We'll intermarry. Just have your men circumcised on the third day at their weakest, most vulnerable moment. That's when they attacked. And they slaughtered them. And they wiped them all out. Now, at that time, you remember, Jacob didn't deal very strongly with him. During that time, he was a very passive father. They seemed to get by with what they had done at the time. But now, as Jacob is under the influence of the Holy Spirit, he calls them out, and he makes clear their sin's going to have to be answered for. You know, sometimes we can think we've gotten away with things that we've done um, that are wrong. We do them, nothing happens. Right? There's no consequences. Well, God must not care. God must not, must not really bother God. Everything's going along smoothly. But the fact is, there will always be a day of accounting. And it may have been several years since this event took place, but we see here at the end of Jacob's life, it's being dealt with. And that's true for every one of us. Our sin will be dealt with, whether in this life or the life to come. And that's why it's always so much better for us to go ahead and deal with it now to acknowledge it, to, to embrace it, to, to confess it here so we don't have to deal with it when we stand before the Lord. And it may be that this declaration is so strong because when Jacob did say something to his sons, even though it was pretty weak, didn't have a lot of backbone behind it, even though they had some sort of an opportunity to admit, you know what, Dad, we, we really did go overboard. We're sorry. No, they sought to justify their actions. You know, they said, well, somebody had to do something. Basically kind of attack on their dad, but he was sitting back, not taking any action. We don't have any indication that they ever repented of what they did. 
if they ever confess that and, and acknowledge they're, they're wrong. And I think that's one of the reasons that this discipline is so strong. But again, their lives are to us an example of what anger can, can do to our lives, where it can take us. We see the danger of giving in to lust in Reuben. We see the danger here of unbridled anger in, in these two. But I think we get an interesting insight about this anger and what, what made it so unrighteous before the Lord there in verse 6. It says, for in their anger they slew a man, and then it says, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. We see this anger was centered in self, driven by self-will. And the Bible talks about righteous and, and unrighteous anger, that there is a place for anger. But where anger becomes sin, where it becomes unrighteous, is when it's based in self. When we're angry because the Lord's character is on the line, because the Lord's character is being tarnished, that's one thing. But when we're angry and upset because what's been done to us and I didn't get my rights and this didn't go my way, that's when we're on dangerous ground. And that's where these two men were, and it led them to do really unimaginable things. And so as a result, Jacob prophesies their future will be a future of being scattered, being divided. They'd be very weak in the nation. That's exactly what happens. The tribe of Simeon would move from the third largest tribe in terms of number when they went out of Egypt to the smallest tribe 35 years later. They would have lost 65% of their tribe over those years. Now, here's what's interesting about Levi, though. Even though their tribe were scattered, their punishment wasn't quite as severe. Because God in his kindness and his goodness would allow the tribe of Levi to be the tribe through which the priest would come. It's really amazing that God would choose this tribe to allow those who are going to represent the people for the Lord to come through them. Now, again, they would be scattered in the sense they wouldn't have their own inheritance. Right? The, the tribe of Levi, the priest, would be living in cities throughout all of, the, all of the land. But that leads to the question, why was Levi's scattering not as great? Why, why was, I mean, they were both involved. Why was Simeon <laughs> treated like he was, and then Levi got to have the priest come through his line? Now, ultimately, we don't know for sure. But we do know that it was the sons of Levi who, when Moses came down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments and saw everybody with Aaron worshiping the golden calf, then when Moses said, whoever is for the Lord, stand with me. We're going to deal with this. We know that the first tribe that came to Moses' side were the tribe of Levi. And many believe that God showed them mercy in light of this. That their failure in the past, now because of their faithfulness, allowed the Lord to pour his mercy and his grace upon them. It's a beautiful picture. Verse 8, we get to Judah. And you can imagine Judah was sweating at this point, right? Right? He hears what about his first, his first three brothers, and he knows he's got a rap sheet. So no doubt what he's thinking is about to, man, I think I need to excuse myself for a moment, Dad. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Probably caught him off guard. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He bows down. He lies down as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? Now, Judah means praise, and the very name is prophetic of the praise that Jacob says will be given to him and his descendants by the rest of the family. Now, as we read, Judah didn't have a praiseworthy start, not by any stretch of the imagination. Just like his three brothers before him, he was guilty of great sin. Right? He's the one who came up with the plan to sell Joseph for money. He's the one who mistreated his daughter-in-law, Tamar, in terms of withholding his third son from her after his first two sons had died. And not only that, he is the one who had relations with his daughter-in-law, thinking she was a prostitute. He had quite the rap sheet. But we know later on, as we just finished reading, there would come that moment when Joseph, recognizing his brothers, decides to put him to the test. And so he put his silver cup, hid it in Benjamin, the youngest, sack, seeing how these brothers are going to respond when another younger brother's life is on the line. Are they going to cast him away like they cast me away? And you remember they opened the sack and they found the, 
the cup in Benjamin's possession, it was Judah who stood up and said, let me take his place. Take me instead of him. Let me be your slave. Not only to protect his younger brother, but also to protect his father from further grief over the loss of one more son. And now here is Jacob led by the Lord, giving Judah the position of leader of the family, acknowledging you're going to have that ruling position among your brothers, comparing him to a lion, the king of the jungle, the ruler. Now Joseph, as we saw, got the double portion of the inheritance, the finances, through his two sons. Now Judah is given the leadership role of the family. Normally those went to the same person. We see the Lord now dividing that up. But ultimately what we see here is, I believe, a picture of God's incredible grace in what happened with Judah. I mean, this man had no right to be any leader of the family whatsoever. He had failed tremendously. And yet, I believe because there was a clear turning from his sin, because there was that true fruit of repentance that was displayed in his heart in terms of now the opportunity he had to, to let Benjamin be taken off, but instead to put his life on the line, we see the Lord giving him an honor he didn't deserve. And his sin was great, just like his older three brothers, but God's grace was greater when he was willing to deal with that sin. And I don't know about you tonight, but that's incredibly encouraging to me. And to know that through this man, not only would his lead his brothers, but the kingly line of the nation of Israel would flow through Judah, which would ultimately be fulfilled in the king of kings, the Messiah coming from his tribe. And in fact, there's even a word here through Jacob of an incredible prophecy of that greater king, of the Messiah. In verse 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the people. Beautiful, beautiful prophecy here. The scepter, of course, was a rod. We know the king would hold. It was a symbol of authority. So the word is that Judah would not lose the ability to rule or have a level of authority among the people until Shiloh comes. And once Shiloh comes, the word is that he would be the one who would have ultimate authority and be given ultimate obedience, which raises the question, well, who in the world is Shiloh? That's some place they fought a civil war battle, I think, maybe. Um, The majority thought, even among the Jews in that day, was that Shiloh was speaking to the Messiah, the coming Savior. The word means he whose right it is or whom it belongs. It is the one who, to whom belongs ultimate rule, ultimate authority. And so we know Israel's history from David up to the Herods, there was a leader in Judah over Israel. And even during times when foreign powers ruled the nation, there was still a limited ruler. And if nothing else, there was limited authority that the nation could, could operate in to punish certain crimes among their own people. And that was all the way up until around A.D. 7, when Rome finally took away really the last right that the nation of Israel had to rule their own people, and that was the right of capital punishment. It's why the Jewish leaders had to go to to Pilate in order to get Jesus crucified, because they didn't have that right to inflict that punishment. The Jewish Talmud says that at that decree, around A.D. 7, that the 70 rulers of the Sanhedrin put on sackcloth, went out in the streets and began wailing and crying out these words, Woe unto us! The scepter is taken away from Judah, and Shiloh has not come. This prophecy. They saw what happened. We have no right to rule ourselves. The Messiah is not here. God's forgotten us. He didn't care about us. He's, his word's not true. They were thinking, it's over, we're done for, there's no hope. When little did they know, in a little town of Bethlehem, not too far away, in a very humble home, was a little boy growing up who was, in fact, their Messiah. Shiloh had come. Not in the way they expected him, but he had arrived. Beautiful prophecy. Verse 11, speaking again of the Lord, 
Binding his donkey to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. This is a description of the reign of Jesus. Again, Shiloh, the ultimate ruler, but in the millennium. Remember, Jacob says these things are of the end, and much of what is being spoken here are things that are still waiting on the fulfillment. There's been some partial fulfillments, but much of this is referring to, to the end. Verse 11 seems to speak of the abundance and the prosperity that will be in the land during the millennium when Jesus rules. Wine in the scripture is a symbol of abundance. And the idea is there's going to be such an abundance that people are not going to have to worry about tying your donkey to a grapevine. And it gets destroyed and it gets trampled and chewed on. Right? You protect it. That's a valuable resource. You don't tie an animal to it. Well, on that day, there's so much it doesn't matter. There's so much wine, you can wash your clothes in it. And verse 11 speaks of of the Lord's power and his strength, his purity, his beauty, the one that's going to rule. Again, through, of all places, the line of Judah. Verse 17, Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships. His border shall adjoin Sidon. Now, now Zebulun would get its inheritance between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee, which for a lot of people raises some, some issues because Jacob says it'll be a haven for ships, meaning it'll be on the coastland. But if you, if you see how the land was divided up, there was a tribe between Zebulun and the Mediterranean, and there was a tribe between Zebulun and the Sea of, of Galilee. They were kind of landlocked. Now, there's some different thoughts on, on this and what's being prophesied, but again, I believe ultimately we're going to understand this is a prophecy that finds its ultimate fulfillment in the millennium. Because you're reading Ezekiel and his description of the tribes during that time, we see that Zebulun will be there on the coast. And I think it's, it's a beautiful prophecy that they would become a haven. One of the things to have prophesied over your life that you would be a, a haven, a place where people can come for protection, for strength, to get out of the storm, right? to, to be able to, to find peace and rest. What an incredible blessing to have that said over you. That would be Zebulun. Verse 14, Issachar is a strong donkey. Now, Issachar's probably thinking, thanks, Dad. I appreciate you calling me a donkey. But let's remember, in that day, a donkey carried great burdens. It was, a, it was really a picture of being a strong worker. It was a very encouraging thing. It says, lying down between two burdens, he saw that rest was good, that the land was pleasant. He bowed his shoulder to bear a burden and became a band of slaves. It's the idea that they're going to be strong workers. They're going to settle in this farming area. We know that the area that they were given as their possession was between two burdens, two mountains, Mount Gilboa, Mount Moray, um, where they settled there in the valley, part of which I believe that Megiddo, Armageddon, is, is found in. And it was a very strategic area. There was a main thoroughfare through there for those traveling in that part of the world. And even though that they would work hard, provide great, you know, agriculture um, for that, that place, because it was in such a tr strategic area, there are a lot of people groups who fought to control it. And as the prophecy speaks of here, there would be many groups that would come in and put Issachar in bondage over the years, trying to secure their hold on that area. And they found themselves many times being um, made slaves over their years. Verse 16, Dan shall judge his people. As one of the tribes of Israel, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels, so that its rider shall fall backward. We see Dan was called to judge the nation. Well, what's a judge do? A judge leads people in righteousness. A judge should, I don't always see this in our day, but a judge should right, determine this is right, this is wrong. That's the call of a judge. That's what God called this tribe to do, of course, we know one of the most famous judges that's recorded for us in the, era, in the era of the judges is, of course, Samson, who was from the tribe of Dan, and, and God used him in, in great ways in spite of himself. But even though Dan was to lead in righteousness, Jacob declares in verse 17 that he would ultimately be a serpent by the way. That is, he would be that which would cause harm and destruction in a very subtle way. Sadly, we know that Dan fell into this 
into this path. Dan would become the major center of idolatry in the nation of Israel. Remember when Jeroboam took the throne after the, the kingdom split, after Solomon, and Jeroboam ruled up north, one of the first things he did was he set up two golden calves, one in, one in Bethel and then one way up north in Dan. And it became a center of, of idol worship, though it was very subtle. It didn't, it didn't start out, Jeroboam didn't start, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm a new king, we're going to worship a new God. It wasn't that at all. We're going to worship the Lord. We're just going to make it easier. We're just going to make it convenient. No sense having to go all the way down to Jerusalem, take all that time, all the hotel expense, you know, gas, all that. You could stay home right here and worship. And, you know, we don't have a temple, but we need something, some object to remind us of God. So I'll just put this up, this golden calf. Let it remind you of the Lord. It seemed to make a lot of sense. Very subtle. But just as God had warned over and over, making idols leads to idolatry and a wrong worship of the Lord. And it led to great sin and consequences for the nation. The nation was bitten and they had a horrible fall. We know the northern kingdom would be taken captive even before the southern kingdom. Again, just as Jacob prophesied. Now at this revelation... Notice this cry that comes out of Jacob's heart, verse 18. I have waited for your salvation, O Lord. Now, this is kind of just out of the blue. It doesn't really seem to fit. Where did this come from? It's almost like Jacob seeing the evil of the future. Again, he, he's, he's getting this divine download, right? The Lord's revealing things to him, letting him see into the future. It's like seeing this evil, out comes just this cry and longing for God's salvation. And it's very interesting, the word that's used here for salvation is the Hebrew word Yeshua, which we know is also the Hebrew name for Jesus. Jacob is literally crying out at this moment, we're waiting for you, Jesus. Jacob gets this preview, it seems. It's this realization of what his own descendants are going to bring into the nation, the harm they're going to do to God's people and to his plan. And he acknowledges, rising up in him is this acknowledgement, God, we're longing for you to come and rescue us, to save your people. We will destroy ourselves. We need you. And it really strikes me, that should be our cry, don't you think, as well, as we see the rise of evil and sin, as we have prophetic insight in the Scripture that we're looking at on Sunday mornings of what's going to come. As we see that evil, that same cry should rise up in our heart. We're waiting for your salvation, O Lord. And he continues, verse 19, turning now to Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. Again, Gad means troop. Um, Gad, we see throughout, a little later in the Old Testament, would su supply many troops to King David in his battles. And even though it's prophesied that an army would oppress him, which happened very often because, again, Gad, along with Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh, they took their possession on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Remember, they had all the cattle, and they thought this is perfect for grazing. We don't need the land. This will be good enough for us, which meant when armies came in to attack Israel, they were the first ones who had to face them. So they were constantly being under attack. They were being, at times, tramped upon, having to, to fight. But the promise is, at last, in the end, he shall triumph. Again, no doubt referring to the millennium. And I read this, and I think of what the prophecy was for Gad, and I think that's also such a truth for many of God's kids, right? that we many times have to face many battles, things that come against us. And for some of us, it just seems like it's just wave after wave after wave, and we're being beat down, and we're being trampled. But to know, in the end... We shall triumph. I think we can claim this same truth. In the end, we will have the victory. Now, we have to remember when the end is. It's not always in this realm. Many times we may walk through this realm constantly being beat down, constantly being trampled, never seeing any relief. But to know this is not the end. In the end, when the Lord comes back and reestablishes, we will triumph at last. Verse 20, bread from Asher shall be rich, and he shall yield royal dainties. Don't you like that? 
I'm not sure that that's the same as hostess cakes or not, but um, the land of Asher would be, would the inheritance, they would be given the land near the Mediterranean Sea, great for growing crops, so they would grow grain, used to, to produce that, which would be upon king's tables is the idea. It's interesting, both Gad and Asher are greatly blessed, but you notice how different? One's going to be a troop, fight battles. The other's going to be in the kitchen, pr providing food, bread. It's a reminder we aren't all the same. God blesses us in different ways, and it's a good thing. Verse 21, Naphtali is a deer let loose. He uses beautiful words. Naphtali would get their inheritance around the Sea of Galilee. It's interesting, that's where much of Jesus' ministry took place, was around the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus would move throughout this area beautifully as a deer let loose. And he would speak many beautiful words. Now we get to Joseph. Joseph is a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him, and hated him. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Now, as we have this word about Jacob, we have an incredible picture here, great insight, I believe, into what allowed Jacob, or excuse me, Joseph to live the life that we've just read about him living. Because we see here, and we, we know it because we read the story, but it's, it's driven home here. Even though he didn't have an easy life, he was shot at. There were arrows of jealousy. There were arrows of animosity. There were arrows of false accusation constantly flying his way. He wasn't fruitful because his life was easy and he was pampered. And he just had it made, and he was taken care of, and he, you know, he had that silver spoon in his mouth. That's not why he was fruitful. He was fruitful, we're told here, because in spite of all that was against him, his roots were sunk in the well, the water of the well. That well, of course, being the Lord. A fruitful bow by a well. He drew his strength from the Lord. He kept a close connection to his God. Even though everyone else seemed to forget him, even though everyone else seemed to, to be against him. And it's in that connection, we're told here, with the Lord, that he found that the hands of his God were mighty. He found that he had a God who would shepherd him. He found a God who was a rock, who was a stone, a support for him. Even though all these arrows were flying around, even though all of this heartache and, and, and destruction was coming his, his way, he was even allowed to be a blessing in the midst of this. Again, not because he had it easy. Because even though his circumstances were nothing any of us would wish, again, his roots were sunk deep in the Lord. And he was able to remain strong and produce this incredible fruit even though this was his lot. This was his circumstances. He reminds me of the words of Psalm 1 where the psalmist writes, His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And Joseph's life shows us a very important principle. Not always a fun one, but it's a true one. And that is some of our most fruitful times are also some of our most difficult times. And you know, it's not what we look for. That's not what we desire. But it's the reality that the Lord works in. And, and if we'll draw to the Lord in the midst of our difficult times, no matter how hard, no matter what the arrows are coming against us, we'll draw into him. If we'll draw into our will, we can find the same things. We can find incredible fruit, just as Joseph did. And he goes on to prophesy concerning him in verse 25, by the God of your father who will help you and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb, blessings of your father, have excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. And my question is, how many times can you use the word blessings in just a few verses? I mean, you count how many times God says blessings will be upon you. Blessings, blessings of the deep, blessings of your father, greater blessings than my ancestors. It's this incredible reminder for us Jake, Joseph was faithful, and because of that, God says there's going to be great reward. Great reward. 
It's a reminder for us that we can never outgive God. You know, sometimes we think, I'm sacrificing all this. I'm having to go through all this. I'm having to take this from this person and, and having to respond back with love and, and have to show them grace and they're doing this and I'm all, all this. And it's a reminder for us that, that God's never a debtor to any man. That if we remain faithful, as Joseph remained faithful, no matter our circumstances, no matter what arrows are flying at us, then God's blessings will come. Obedience always brings blessing. Now, again, we have to remember, it may not always come in this life, but it will come. And then finally, we come to the baby of the family, Benjamin, verse 27. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he shall devour the prey, and at night, he shall divide the spoil. I read that and think, that's kind of not what you expect for the baby of the family, right? A ravenous wolf. You know, Benjamin's going to be the little lamb. But this speaks of the fact that he'll have a reputation of fierceness among this tribe. Many warriors will come from, from the tribe of, of Benjamin. And, and some of this fierceness was not always the best. It takes us back to that horrible story in, in Judges of the Levi and his concubine who ended up spending the night there in the area of the tribe of, of Benjamin. And that night men from the tribe of Benjamin come wanting to do harm to the Levite and he ends up giving his concubine instead and the next morning he finds her dead and that's when he chops her up and sends out 12 pieces to the 12 tribes and remember the rest of the tribes were so angry that they attacked the Benjamites and almost wiped them out almost destroyed this tribe if it wasn't for God's intervention his promises toward them in saving them and saving a remnant and so this, this ravishness would, always, would not always be uh, the best. And then Moses wraps it up in verse 28. He says, All these are the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessings. I think there's a couple of very important truths here as, as Moses kind of sums up the blessing that Jacob gave over his, his sons. And, and first of all, we see that though there would be consequences for their actions, though there would be some blessings they forfeited because of the decisions they made, Moses is very clear to tell us they were each blessed. All 12 tribes, in one way or another, they were blessed. Now, the fact is, none of them deserved any of the blessing they received. Not one of them. They were all fallen. They were all, at some point or another, walking away from God's purposes and plans and, and character for their lives. I mean, based on their actions, God should have said to Jacob, I'm done. I'm starting over. You know, we made it through Abraham. We made it through Isaac. We even made it through you, Jacob. But your boys, they ruined it all. Sorry, we got, we got, to, we got to start over with this plan. But the Lord didn't do that. And isn't that how it is in all of our lives? that all of us should be grateful and thankful that the Lord gives us any blessing, right? that he gives us any place in his family. I think sometimes we can get the attitude, well, well God didn't give me this, or he didn't allow me to, to, to do that. But the ultimate truth is we don't deserve anything from him but his wrath. And notice Moses is very specific to say that each was blessed according to his own blessing, not only were they all blessed in spite of what they deserved, in spite of their past, but they each had a unique blessing. Just as we, we made the point earlier, right? Gad was, was blessed to be a tribe of warriors, whereas Asher was blessed to provide food. We also saw one of the tribes was blessed to use beautiful words. One was, was blessed to be hard workers. One was blessed to be a, to be a haven. How God wants to work and use each of our lives is different from how he wants to work and use other lives. And that's really why it makes no sense for, for you and I, though I fall prey to it all the time, to compare ourselves and compare our blessings with others. That's what Jesus was trying to get across to Peter. Right? Remember Peter, Jesus tells him, here's what I've got for you, Peter. And Peter looks over at John and is like, 
I got to do, well, what does he have to do? What does he have to go through? What's it going to be like for him? And you remember the Lord had to say to Peter, Peter, when it, when it comes to what I want to do with, with John, what's that to you? He said, Peter, you follow me. You walk in what I have for you, Peter. Right? Realizing, Peter, you shouldn't have anything. You remember what you just did to me? You just denied me. You said you didn't know me. And yet I'm here to bless you. Yet I'm here to say I still have a future for you. I still want to use you. I still want to work through you. I still want to allow you to have a part in my eternal plan. Be thankful for that, Peter. And you walk according to the unique way I've called you to walk and what I've given you to do. And tonight, as we close, my challenge to, to myself and to, to each of us is may we be a people who are grateful for whatever blessing and calling the Lord has for our lives. Because we sure know what we deserve. And may we get our eyes off of each other and simply follow what the Lord has for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we are amazed. As we look at the scripture and, and the men and the women that you used, Lord, that you would bless this family in spite of all their failings, Lord that you would show them such mercy and grace and you would use them to be the tribe that would bless the world. And you would specifically use the tribe of Judah of all tribes to bring forth Shiloh, to bring forth the Messiah, the ultimate one who deserves our praise. But Lord, as amazing as their story is, it just reminds us how amazing our story is, that you would pick people like us. God, in spite of our past and in spite of our present where we continue to fail you and drop the ball and we walk according to, to the nature of Jacob instead of the nature of Israel. Lord, you continue to bless us and show us your mercy and your grace, Lord. We don't want to take advantage of that. We can rely on that grace, Lord. Our heart is to repent of our sin, to turn from it. But Lord, we know that what we have, we don't deserve. And so we just want to say thank you tonight for including us in your plan. And Lord, even though our specific plan may not look like other people's plan, and we may think, well, they get to do this and they get to do that, and I just get this, Lord, we thank you that you have a unique plan for us. And Lord, whatever it is, it's good and it's right and it's perfect. And so Lord, may we embrace it. May we walk it out. And again, with thankful hearts, grateful hearts, and may we use our lives for your glory, for your kingdom. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.